Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 39. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. As always, I'd like to begin by thanking the wonderful patrons who continue to support this podcast. I'm so very grateful for your encouragement and generosity. A full list of patrons is available on my website under the Patrons tab. If you love Talking Tudors and would like to show your appreciation and support the work I do, just click on the Be My Patron on Podbeam badge on the homepage of my website www.onthetutortrail.com or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tudors patron family and you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. July's price is a copy of Unleash Your Inner Tudor, Henry VIII's inspirational guide to a completely sizzling, sparkly, tyrannical, much wider, demanding and sexier you by none other than Henry VIII, also known as Andy Dembski. A huge thank you to His Majesty for sponsoring this wonderful prize. Now, on to today's episode. I'm delighted that joining me on the show to talk about the Mary Rose is Alex Hildred. Alex is Head of Research and Curator of Ordnance and Human Remains at the Mary Rose Trust. Alex joined the project in 1979 as a graduate archaeologist. She was an archaeological supervisor during the 1979 to 1982 excavations. Alex has researched and published the weapons of the ship, producing one of the five volumes comprising the archaeology of the Mary Rose, and has worked with the Royal Armouries manufacturing and firing full-scale copies of guns recovered. Alex has taught both at undergraduate and postgraduate level, and within the Nautical Archaeological Society training scheme. My conversation with Alex straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Welcome to Talking Tutors, Alex. How are you? 
Fine, thank you. What about you? I'm well, thank you. I thought we could begin by you just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background, please. Uh, okay, well, I was born in Canada and stayed there until I was 14, and that's where I first became interested in archaeology, and that was through a history teacher who, in fact, had been to Oxford and had studied history there and uh, was talking about an excavation she'd been on and was talking in particular about the human remains. And from that moment on, I didn't want to do anything except for archaeology. And so when I came to England when I was 14, there were a whole load of wonderful um, courses and digs that you could go on through the Council for British Archaeology. And a lot of them were abroad as well, the Archaeology Abroad Service. Uh, service. So um, I began to excavate uh, on weekends, in all my holidays, and did an awful lot of land excavation before going to university in England and studying prehistory and archaeology. Wonderful. Thank you. So you're the head of research and curator of Ordnance and Human Remains at the Mary Rose Trust. What does this role actually involve? <laughs> Uh, well, quite a lot of different things, really. Um, when I was one of the archaeological supervisors during the excavation underwater between 1979 and 1982, because that's when I joined the project in 1979. And when we came ashore over the winter, um, because you, we obviously couldn't couldn't dive all year round, yes. um, there were you know certain jobs to do. So part of mine was recruiting divers for the next year, but also to begin to research things. And I'd begun to have an interest in how the guns were lifted um, during the excavation, because each one, the, a lot of the guns were still on their carriages, so to begin with, we took the guns off the carriages and took the carriages apart and, and brought them up separately, and then we began to be bolder and try and uh, lift them as one unit, and you actually had to sort of withdraw them like teeth from the gum of, the, of a ship that had turned on its side, mm -hmm. so it was actually quite a complex operation, and I began to, to make notes of, of that, and then similarly, when the boxes of longbows came up, we excavated them on the deck and make notes about that. And so Margaret Rule, when um, she was the director of the excavation, when the excavation finished in 1982, she said, well, I want you to research all of the weapons on board the ship. You can do the whole lot. And actually, out of the 19,000 objects, probably about 4,500 um, are, are related to weaponry. So it's actually right. quite a lot of objects to catalogue, to study, to try and work out what they are. So 1,200 iron shot, each one has to be weighed and the dimensions done and try and work out which guns they were for etc so a lot of that's cataloging and research and because of the various research projects regarding the ordnance things like making uh, casting uh, guns in the traditional fashion and then doing gun trials on it to work out um, the distance and the capability of them and and uh, things like that I, I had a lot of research partners and so in the end what was basically curator of ordnance um, became head of research and so uh, the human remains came on a bit later actually when, when we began to look at the effects of things like longbows on the archer's bodies and so uh, there wasn't anybody looking at human remains or in particular and so I, I sort of accepted that as an add-on really. Right, it sounds like a terribly exciting role, really fantastic. So before we talk more about your long association with the Trust, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about the history of the ship, the Mary Rose. Well she sort of parallels Henry's life really. One of the first things he did uh, when he ascended the throne in 1509, within a year he'd signed the warrant for two new ships to be built um, and they were to become the Mary Rose and the Peter Pomegranate. Um, both of those probably named after um, the Virgin Mary as in the case of the Mary Rose and St. Peter in the case of the Peter Pomegranate okay. and then the Rose and the Pomegranate which were Henry's and his first wife Catherine's of Aragon's um, symbols that they, mm -hmm. you know that's what they wore on their crest, their coat of arms if you like. And and um, and so, you know, it's almost within a year he'd done that, and he inherited five ships. And by the time he he died in um, 1547, he'd built up the navy to be 58 vessels, including 20 great ships, of which the Mary Rose continued to be one. So, and then he, you know, he died two years after the Mary Rose sank. So he basically signed the warrant for her to be built at Portsmouth, and um, and watched her sink in 1545 from South Sea Castle, which was one of the 38 castles that he built or rebuilt uh, to fortify the coastline of England right the way from Cornwall and Devon right the way up to Berwick-on-Tweed against the, the French who were his uh, major uh, foes during the entire 
um, type of his reign. So she really does parallel his reign, and he seems to have taken a very great interest in her. So through various letters and papers in in um, various places, we've got letters from Henry asking about the Mary Rose and reports sent from, say, the admirals of the fleet as to how the, the fleet are doing, praising the Mary Rose. And so we think that he had some great interest in her from the start. And in fact, recent research has shown that, that he actually paid for the Mary Rose out of his personal pocket. So they really were the king's ships. Wow, that's fascinating stuff. Now, you've mentioned that obviously the Mary Rose was active for much of Henry VIII's reign. So what battles did, did the ship take part in? Well, active isn't perhaps the, the way we think of active right. going out and, and fighting huge battles. A lot of it during the reign was things like just what, what they called patrolling or keeping the narrow seas. So that's just being basically watching in the channel, patrolling, be having a presence there, fighting pirates, stopping piracy, because that was huge. There was a great amount of trade between the continent and England, and so pirates were rife. So a lot of the times the fleet, which mm -hmm. Henry Henry is, is sometimes named as, as being the creator of the Royal Navy, the modern Royal Navy, and to a certain extent that's true, because what he did, which was different from the previous kings, was he maintained by keeping the... when when war had ended the ships actually were kept in places like Portsmouth or Woolwich and they were kept not quite ready but they could be made ready within three months so rather than have to bring in merchantmen and prepare them for war uh, in times of in times of war he would actually have a fleet that, that was partially ready to go so it's not as though she was consistently patrolling and it's not as though they were consistent wars in fact we only have uh, evidence of her um, fighting in, in actually one war, and that was the First French War in 1512, when she was um, part of a fleet that engaged the French fleet off Brest, and one in which the flagship, the British flagship, because Mary Rose wasn't flagship at that time, and the Regent and the Cordillère, which was the Breton flagship, uh, locked together finally after hours and hours, seven hours of, of battle. Um, they got close enough together for boarding, which was the tactics at the time in, in 1512, and the two locked together um, powder magazine on one blew up the English then threw a whole load of fireworks into the foray and the two were like exploding volcanoes and sank off breast and interestingly there is this year and last year uh, the French are actually looking for remains of, of the two of those ships because there were quite a lot of, of guns and ordnance within both of them and so that that's ongoing at the moment so that's really the only time we have evidence of her actually fighting what, but she did uh, she was with the rest of the fleet for a lot of engagements where things like troops were landed in France and villages were burnt. I mean, that's the sort of thing that, that seems to go on quite a lot. Um, but no other great battles, so that's the only one. And the beginning of that one is that she is, Mary Rose is supposed to have shot the main mast out of um, one of the French flagships. So um, it's possible that, you know, that's, that's the beginning of longer range warfare at sea, although it doesn't seem to have really come into its own until the middle of the century in, in things like the Battle of the Solent. Okay, thank you. Now, so what was um, life like for the sailors on board a ship like the Mary Rose? Well, oh, dark, I would have thought, for a start. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, the crew came on board. Now, we got a list, an ordnance list for the Mary Rose, which includes soldiers, mariners, and gunners. And so there are, you know, about 200 mariners, and mariners are basically the seamen. So they're their main job is actually to keep the ship ship shape, if you like, make sure all the, the rigging is tight because hemp stretches, so you're constantly having to attend to, to the rigging. They take turns at the helm. They do watches, so, so the crew comes on board, or the mariners come on board, and the entire crew, in fact, is divided into two groups, the starboard watch and the port watch, and they take turns every four hours, so you have a four-hour watch, so sleeping would have been actually in your four hours off, you would right. have to catch a bit of sleep somewhere, so for a start, I think all the people would be quite tired, mm -hmm. there were no hammocks until the next hundred years so it would have just been you know maybe if you're lucky sharing a straw um, mattress with with somebody on the opposite watch and putting it wherever you could to find a place to sleep so the probably the the upper deck and the well the upper deck in the stern would have been where the ship was um, steered from conned from so that would have probably been off limits so it would have been around the guns on the main deck or on the storage deck below which is 
below the waterline and dark with um, without any uh, light except for light that could have come through ventilation hatches or main hatches that, that went down through the ship. And obviously, if it, if it was wet or windy, those would be closed. So it would have been quite airless and dark. And I think everybody would have been tired because, as I say, if you're if you're doing on for four hours, off for four hours, out of those four hours that you're off, you know, you're probably only going to get an hour and a half good mm. sleep if you're in an area where where people are sort of walking over you and tending to uh, to the ship because the ship doesn't stop sailing and um, I suppose if you're at anchor it's slightly different so they would have had one or two good meals a day was certainly one hot meal a day which was usually supposed to be at 6 p.m. but very boring food so fish three times a week and then meat you know, sort of fish four times a week and meat three times a week and the odd bit of butter cheese and um, the, the meat was a mixture of either pork or beef, and that would have been salted bacon or salt beef, which would then have to be hung over the side the day before to to slightly hydrate it, and very, very hard biscuit, and then a gallon of beer, uh, which was actually very, very light beer. It was mixed with water. And if you were lucky, a pint of peas a couple of times a week. So that was it. Not not very high in, in good things for... Uh, you know, for citrus fruits or anything, but um, <laughs> but enough to keep them alive. And and we worked it out, and it's about four thousand calories a day. Right. Okay. That's, that's pretty so that's high. That's actually mm. quite. It's pretty high. Yeah. Um. So I think it would have been cold. I think it would have been dark and damp and smelly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the lanterns, for example, certainly during action, there would have been no. Uh, the only lanterns that we found in the Mary Rose sank during action one was in the carpenter's cabin and one was in the galley not even the the surgeon had a lantern so they were all put somewhere safe towards the stern of the ship in one area um, along with the candles the, the barrels of candles so those were sort of kept safe and out of the way if you like so um, I think it would have been quite hard quite a hard life and they, they didn't have many clothes and certainly the, the men did not bring their own chests so if they brought clothes it was probably in a sack and in fact we found one sack full of shoes on the storage deck and it was shoes of also as a, they'd just literally been thrown in there some were pairs some weren't pairs all different sizes and you know maybe those were just there to be scrabbled through and, and you grab a pair if you need it because a lot of the mariners would have found it more easy to have bare feet on the deck. And in fact, if you go on a sailing ship today, a lot of people um, don't don't wear shoes. And in particular, climbing up the rigging and things, it's a lot easier if you could use your toes in order to, to help um, hold on, if you like, grip the ropes. So um, not much in the way of clothing, perhaps woolen, woolen um, trousers and a linen shirt, undergarments. They did have undergarments. Uh, if you were wearing shoes, you would, would have worn woolen socks and perhaps a flat cap and that would have been it for the mariners the soldiers and the gunners would have had leather jerkins on top of it which would have offered some protection uh, against uh, enemy fire of any sort but not a huge amount we don't have any evidence we have one breastplate so not a lot of evidence for things like armor mm -hmm. which you wouldn't really expect on a ship you you do get armor when ships are taking people to a, a battle on land and in fact the mary rose in 1512 when she basically was a troop transporter um, to, to land uh, troops in France. Uh, she was carrying armor then, but not for the inventory we have of her um, for the 1545 engagement. Wow, those details really bring it all to life. Thank you. Could you talk to us, Alex, about what happened on the morning of 19th of July, 1545? Why did the Mary Rose sink? <laughs> How long the million thought? dollar question. <laughs> well, I think, I think the jury's still out it's and still it's out, probably yeah. mixed probably a mixture of things but the story does start they're, they're different uh, they're different accounts now that the, there are two that are um probably the best one is by martin du ballet who is a soldier who's french and who was there and who committed it to a journal some 20 years later but it, but you know he was an eyewitness and the other is um from the person who was on behalf of Charles V, he was basically the ambassador of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and at that time, King of Spain. Um, and he was sent to Portsmouth to uh, watch the whole thing. And he says that he, he talked to a Fleming who survived the disaster, who said that the ship had fired guns on one side of the ship and was turning to fire guns on the other when the wind caught her sails, plunged the, the gun ports on the open, uh, on the side that had just been fired through the water, into the water, mm. which sank her. So that's the best, um, I think, account of the end of it. But the story sort of begins the day before, on the 18th, when 
uh, the fleet, the, the French fleet, were actually sighted off the Isle of Wight, and that's when Henry, who was actually on one of the on the Gracieux, the flagship at the time, goes onto the shore to be with with the troops that he's brought from all over southern England to actually uh, position themselves at Portsmouth because it was he knew he had spies and he knew that Portsmouth was the main target, and so he bought um, many of his land troops down, and uh, Portsmouth was the largest naval base in England at the time, so it, it was you know, ripe for attack. It was the right place to go. And uh, he brought them all down there. So the day before, the fleets actually engage, and it says that they fought for about two hours until darkness put an end to, to the fight. And so then it resumes the next day, and the French account then says du Bellay that the morning was calm and without wind, and for for most of the day, that was favourable to the French, because the French are, uh, if you think of Portsmouth being on the south coast of England, um, the French are to the east, and the, and the English fleet is gathered outside of the mouth of the harbour, all the 30 ships, well, not, not the whole of the 58, but about 30 of them are gathered together um, in the only area within that, between uh, the, the south coast of England and the Isle of Wight. So it's a thin strip of water called the Solent that used to be an old river that, that flew, that uh, went through the area, but now it's a stretch of sea. And so there's a deep water channel there. So basically the fleet is is anchored near the edge of the deep water channel. And that's the only place that the, the fight could happen. But in the morning, without wind, the, the English were really becalmed. And because the French with basically an allied invasion, which had uh, Italian and and Spanish um, uh, vessels within it, had 25 galleys, so they were rowed galleys, and these had always been Henry VIII's worry, because obviously with a big ship, no matter how many gun, guns you've got on it, you can over power something but you've got to get to it you've got to get within range you've got to be able to and without the motive power of oars if you're relying on sails obviously you're stuffed and so for the morning certainly dur during most of the day you've got the french the galleys the venetian galleys from from the french um, fleet coming out towards the english and taking pops at them all morning if you like and um, it says then towards evening a, a breeze came up and the english began to you know put their sails up and start to to fight back the great ships and very soon uh, within that the mary rose uh, sinks now the french accounts say that, that she was sunk by enemy gunfire the English accounts have a, a number of, of sources. One is uh, this, this gust of wind and the turning. A lot of them mention a gust of wind, and so I think that it's probably quite true that if you're, you're taking a maneuver and you are turning, and in fact, the position of the Mary Rose is heading back in towards the harbour, so she's done a complete turn around from where the fleet, the fleet is pointing out into the mid-channel. She's turned around and coming back, so the idea that she she'd obviously turned she'd been in with the rest of the fleet come out turned and so firing her guns you know seems to make sense and the fact that some of them on the starboard side were loaded and some were unloaded and one was being reloaded as the ship sank we found when we excavated it um it tends to add credence to that but um so the French say they sunk her by gunfire the English say that there were too many um crew on board too many overloaded with guns that's another one gun ports too close to the water line well they're not uh, but they were open the gun port lids were not secured closed every single one on the starboard side when we tunneled under the ship to find him um, to uh, excavate under there and, and put the uh, cables under that we tie the cables through the ship that eventually lifted her uh, the gun port lids were all open and hinged upwards above the ports so whatever got the Mary Rose into that position certainly water entering through the ports was what did it in the end but there are all sorts of other potentials within there uh, one is the fact that perhaps she the night before had had a few shots below the water line that perhaps hadn't been noticed mm -hmm. and so there was a bit of water in the within the ballast the ballast is actually shingle it's like beach pebbles and mo for most of it within the hold it's not contained by any partition so once it starts to move if it gets water in it it's a bit like a big sort of river of mud with pebbles in it and so that could be if it if that goes to one side that could be a reason why she didn't bounce back up and bring her ports, you know, back up because mm -hmm. ships can go, you know, quite far over uh, and then bounce back. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a little bit of water in the ballast, if you have got wind that's pushing the sails down, you know, that's that's uh, another thing that, that would help with it. Um, another more recent, and this is where history is really important, it, really exciting, um, whilst 
one of the historical advisors for the Mary Rose, Charles Knighton, uh, was researching William and Mary in a, in the Hatfield House, which is um, a, an old uh, yes, yeah. home near Cambridge. He came across a pile of papers which were misfiled, and it's basically they were all 1545, and one of them was the final crew list for the Mary Rose wow. and uh, various, yeah, various other things. And one of them was a letter from two, sh- and it's torn, so it's only part of a document. It's two shipwrights who are writing back to... I mean, they're writing to the king, but obviously whether it's being sent to his secretary uh, or not. And it says it, it's about putting guns, putting culverins, which are big um, forward-facing brass guns, uh, long-range guns, in the bows, in the bow castle of big ships. And one of them is a Mary Rose, one of them is a Janet, one of them is a New Bark. And it says for the Mary Rose, we can't put them there uh, because... For a start, there are two iron guns there that are long-range iron guns, firing iron shots. So you know they've got we've got good firepower there. If we do it, we'll have to take out the main mast, which will affect the uh, riding bits, which are the big rollers basically that you you put the the cables round to to bring up the um, the bow anchors, and that will be a great weakening to the ship at that point. And uh, we advise you not to do it. And furthermore. In the front of the stern castle, on the castle deck and the deck above, we've got a culverin and then a saker. Now, for us, that's the first evidence we ever had of two castle decks. We'd only thought of one. The structure is given way um, before the second, before the end of the first castle deck. We've got very, very little of that, only three planks. So we've had to revise our entire idea of the um, structure of the Mary Rose based on that and the disposition of guns that I'd worked out based on only one castle deck. But the intriguing thing is, is we've never found the, the bow castle, the Mary Rose, or even the bow um, forward of ex- of the turn of where the, the stem, the keels and the big longitudinal beam in the middle of the bottom of the ship, basically. That, that then when it sweeps up to form the bow it becomes a stem piece and we found that in 2005 and it had broken at where the turn is and fallen over to the left hand side taking part of the lower hull structure of the port side with it but that's exactly where if that work had been undertaken on the ship when we don't know whether it has or not this is this is about um, February 1545 that the letter dates from if Henry had insisted that happen, you know, perhaps that weakened the ship and perhaps during uh, the battle, or, you know, that that mm-hmm. happened and, and the ship became unstable by itself. So there are a whole load of things that could still be part of it, but we don't think it's over too much ordnance because the, the things that we've got and the, and the weapons that we know were brought up in Tudor times only equal what we've got within the assemblage, the, the list for the ship anyway. And the list for the Mary Rose is the same as basically all the other big ships. She's slightly got slightly heavier weapons, if you like, stronger weapons, longer range, etc. But if the Mary Rose is unstable, then all of them were. So I, we don't think it's it's too many guns. It's unlikely, the other thing is perhaps there were more troops on board because she was only going out into the Solent. Um, that's unlikely we found out of the 500 uh, listed on board uh, evidence of 179 individuals that's skull skulls so that's you know roughly half we'd ex- expected to find more if if they had been an extra 100 people on board you'd have ex- expected to find remains of those so you know it, it's basically a whole manner of different things that, that could have contributed to it but finally it was water entering through the open gun ports <laughs> Wow, what a, what a fantastic discovery. I love stories like that. It, it gives me hope that there's so much more out there for us to find. Um, yeah. Alex, Alex so, how many, so you think roughly 300 people on board? or No, the, no, 500 people on board. 500 people on board. Of which the accounts say only 35 um, escaped Goodness. Uh, with their lives. So that's quite a, quite a loss of life. Mm, it is. Absolutely. And now you mentioned earlier that you were part of the team that actually excavated the Mary Rose between, yeah. I think it was 1979, 1982. Um, yes. And you talked a little bit about what your role involved. What was it like to work on such an exciting and in many ways a groundbreaking project? Well, it was groundbreaking when you think about it now. You know, there were no, there wasn't a rule book. There was one guide to potential underwater archaeology and that was it um so we were making it up as we went along and you think about it i mean most of us i think i worked out the average age the other day was about 23 mm-hmm. so we we had um three different shifts and we our diving support vessel was anchored on a four-point mooring above the bow of the, the mary rose with shot lines that went down to a grid so the entire site which is roughly 40 meters long and say 15 meters wide was 
basically divided into three meter areas by a, a grid of bright yellow gas pipes so you could see them in, in you know with any visibility at least you could see them and um and those sort of were positioned over the natural compartments within the ship so the structure of the ship the the where the big knees for example on the main deck divide it the supporting knees that tie the deck into the side of the ship divide the ship naturally into bays so like the gun bays and that that's reflected on all of the decks that the big supporting beams are roughly at three meter intervals so it basically divided the ship into its own the, the structure of the ship dictated how we how we work the trenches so the whole area we opened up and took down as as one or we tried to as much as possible keep the trenches evenly so that you could try and look at it as an open area excavation and see what what belonged with what at any moment in time so we tried to do it as stratigraphically as you can bearing in mind it's being turned on its side and you're having to to dig between decks and then remove the deck planks as you go along because they were held onto the beams with iron nails which had corroded so it was a dismantling and an excavation at the same time um, we were divided as I say into three three groups and we'd stay one night on board the, the dive vessel so that you could start as as soon as the tides were right um, uh, in the morning and then work until you know whatever time at night until you'd exhausted all your staff so we'd have probably about four or five archaeologists on board and a finds person and sometimes uh, an environmental archaeologist would be paid one one night every three and so work could continue around the clock. Now, we didn't dive through the night until 1982 when uh, we were preparing the ship, the, the getting rid of the last bit of archaeology, whilst the salvage and recovery team, which were some of the archaeologists who'd gone and done professional qualifications so they could tunnel under the ship in order to uh, place the bolts to secure the lifting wires. And, uh, and we were working, trying to dismantle this huge brick built galley in the in the ship so we were working all the westerly tides because the tides went across the ship so you could only work in certain areas at certain times otherwise your debris which was taken away by airlifts which are basically suction devices which which jettison the unwanted spoil down tide so you could only work on one side of the ship in, in particular tides so we were dismantling a structure on the westerly tide so we'd come on board to work those tides and that could be leaving the harbour at um, two o'clock in the morning to start at three and then working through that tide and then coming off and the next lot would go on for the next tide. So it was quite intense, but um, during 80, 81, it was a bit more relaxed when you had your, your team on board and you just work until it got too dark to work. And again, you'd be up as early in the morning as you could do. And it was wonderful to actually be on board the whole time because you could then discuss things with at night with your fellow archaeologists and make sure that all of the um, documentation for all the finds was up to date and the site books were kept so I think it's it's probably the, the best way to to do a site like that is to actually be isolated and be on board the diving support vessel and I think the, the camaraderie uh, that we had between us is something that's sort of un, unparalleled yeah wonderful and so were you an experienced dive obviously before that not really no. um <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, I learned to dive at university, but most of my dives had been training dives in a quarry in the north of England. So a, a few sea dives, but right. but no, I wasn't. But that was soon rectified because you do at least two dives a day. Um, and then you do that for two days and then be, basically you then go off for a day in order to to uh, make sure that, that uh, you, your nitrogen levels were, were down. Yeah. So you, you go you go to sh ashore, basically. Right. So, no, I wasn't, but I soon became very soon became. <laughs> in the conditions on the Mary Rose, which which were really variable. Right. I mean, sometimes it's lovely. You could go down the shot line and at about four meters off the bottom, you'd be able to see the, the yellow poles and see a bit, uh, you know, maybe one or two bays of the ship, but, uh, but never connect them together because you know and you became very intimately associated with particular areas right. but usually it was half a meter visibility sometimes it was nothing you know really really dark and um and it was completely by feel and we gridded that the grid had been very well set up with at every in intersection there was a raised tag that you could feel the number and you knew which number you know what area you were going to and we had a slate with a dot with the plan of the site on it as well or certainly for new people and we became very very adept at having volunteer divers to increase our labor force because we were only a team of, of 12 or 13 archaeologists and then a, a sort of a full-time team of 10 other people but in order to maintain the uh, 45 
uh, sort of 80 dives a day that you tried to do, I think that was the most we did was 85 dives in one day, you'd, you'd need a lot of people. So mm. I think, again, when I looked at the, the figures, that the most individual names on any one day that came to dive in, the, the, we'd take a boat of 12 people, six times a day would leave uh, the Canberra dock and go out to the ship and then drop the divers and then the divers who'd been on before would get back on the ship because on the boat and go to shore because you could only have a certain number of people actually on the slight or the diving support vessel so it was a really well organized group of people and these many of these were volunteers now we insisted then that they had some you know, open water experience that ideally that you know, their suits had to be a minimum thickness etc and we looked at all their dive records um, beforehand um, but we trained them so everybody so people were encouraged to stay for 10 to 12 days is a minimum and we trained them in they first went on a site tour so that would be with with one of us either an archaeologist or one of the, the full-time uh, team members and then uh, airlift training as well as uh, a video about the site and a video about airlift training etc and they would be expected to to take down with them a slate and a, and a bag which we pre-prepared for each individual diver with their name on it and um, and draw a sort of a plan of every object that they lifted they sort of draw a plan of where it was relative to the other ones in that area mm -hmm. and then when they came and brought the objects up they went straight to the fines bay where uh, one of the fine supervisors would, would allocate artifact numbers to each of those objects and they would then make sure when they did it in their dive report that those numbers were beside the drawings of the objects that we got so that was our way of positioning objects and we found that so fantastically useful when we put together the displays for the new Mary Rose Museum in 2013 which has the ship at its center and then we've only got the starboard side of the ship with with parts of four decks on the other side opposite we built three layers of a glazed gallery with a top layer without glazing so uh, huge huge galleries that, that exactly mimic the ship um, not in wood they're they're just the, the areas so right. and put objects that were found exactly opposite in this mirror image hull space right. so that you can down the gallery between and you can look at the ship on one side and then turn your head to the other and say for example you see the, the carpenter's cabin in the ship on one side and you look to uh, the other side and you see uh, all the objects put on the benches uh, in the same way as they were in within the cabin um, put within those cases and that was all through the uh, dive logs of the the divers who came and joined us so uh, they were fantastic all of them about 500 different names goodness what a monumental task amazing so you've mentioned that there was an extraordinary number of artifacts that were actually recovered from the the wreck site um, around 19,000 is that right uh, about 19,000 but yeah. that doesn't include timbers right, or okay the human remains or environmental mm. samples they're about 6000 samples so for for example when we took a barrel apart we took we took samples at various layers of it when we took it if we excavated a chest underwater which we did to begin with and then we decided that we'd be there for the rest of our lives if we continued yeah. to do that <laughs> and we would put them inside a modern uh, uh, pre-made box that was weighted uh, and uh, and then lift them whole and excavate them on deck so we we took a lot of environmental samples so what are, what are some of your personal favourites, you know, artefacts that the public can view at the museum today? I have quite a few of them. <laughs> um, one of them is, and it's, it's part of this new display uh, regarding the human remains and oh, the yes. ethnicity of the crew, but one of them is a little bone panel, and it was found inside a chest by somebody on the main deck, and this was in the gun bay that the gun was being reloaded as the ship sank, and it's a tiny bone panel, uh, probably about four inches, I don't know, 100 millimeters long, mm -hmm. and it's obviously part of a series of panels that um, made up a, a chest, and it's a bone, it's not ivory, it's bone, and it's got two angels, so in walking, if you think about them, the side view of two angels walking with their wings behind them, and they're carrying tall candles with flames on the top, and there's a little window of uh, what looks like a Renaissance house behind them, they're wearing beautiful long flowing robes with uh, belts at their waist, and this has been um, identified, was identified in 1982, I think it came up in 82, as being um, part of an Embriachi casket. And these were only made by the Embriachi family. And at the time, uh, at the end of their workshop time, it was in Venice. They started in Florence, but in Venice, and in about 1425, that they stopped uh, manufacturing them. So, you know, that means that whoever owned that chest 
this tiny panel which was a hundred years old when the ship sank over a hundred years old and then had been buried for nearly 500 years and then we find it you know within chest and what's more within that chest as well there was a beautiful beautiful pouch and it's one of the most highly decorated pouches we've got with uh, it's silk lined and it's got uh, uh, several flaps and within one of the flaps that are embroidered so really pretty with floral decoration I mean obviously you've not got the thread but you've got the holes the stitch holes within the leather and within that was a tiny lead token with 1542 and this is about the size of your baby pinky finger right. um uh 1542 on one side and then something that looks like the black madonna uh on the other side so the virgin mary and things that are similar today are still sold at the pilgrimage site of rocca madura in france so you know to have two things that one might be French, the other is definitely Italian within this, and also a tiny little box with seal with a G-I on it as the person's name, his seal, you know, its initials. You know, that's really so personal. It's, it's mm. uh, you know, it's unbelievable. And so I think that's the, the intensity of the, the personal nature that the Mary Rose has to offer, and it's just so layered. And when you get into the, the contents of a pouch within a chest and you're getting something that, that's suggesting that somebody's for it and would have coveted that you know was it a fair family heirloom what was it um it's just uh, so fantastic really <laughs> yeah i know it's amazing that they sound beautiful now you've worked with uh, swansea university on creating 3d virtual artifacts can you tell us a little bit about this project okay well really that project grew out of of us wanting to identify archers within the within the human skeletons when the osteoarchaeologist Anne sterling in the 80s was putting together the bones and that's what she was tasked with not looking at them for morphological traits not doing anything but trying to from in some places they were like 22 skeletons together so it's actually a big sorting Gosh, game yeah. to actually try and rebuild people so out of all of these huge number of bones she managed to put together as, as i said we've got 179 skulls that are, that's our most numerous single bone mm -hmm. um well it's not a single bone but that's a single unit if you like and um so she, she managed to put together parts of 92 individuals from the 179, the minimum that we know we've got. 24 are matched with, with uh, skulls. So we've still got a lot of skulls unmatched with bodies. Yeah. But we were trying to look. She noticed that there seemed to be far more. She'd worked in other other groups, if you like, medieval populations, post-medieval populations. And she noticed that there were quite a number of the shoulder blades, the ends of the shoulder blades that hadn't fused. You've got a bone called the acromium at the very end. And uh, sometimes it was bilaterally on, on both within the same scapula. Sometimes it was, or scapulae, um, sometimes it was one-sided. And she had thought that that might be because stresses that archers, you know, do put a fair amount of stress and they, she talked to a lot of them and it seemed that they did. She had one in a CAT scan of one of them that showed not not the fact that they had fused, but, but that obviously there was a lot of wear and tear on that particular part of the shoulder. And we actually wanted to test that. So we, we this was with the University of Swansea in South Wales. And we put, using motion capture, we put a whole load of uh, targets around the room and then... On, on an individual and actually worked out where the greatest stresses were and they were actually on the arm that holds the bow as you, you push the bow and then you pull the string at the same time and it's actually on the radius and the ulna of the bow arm and usually when bone is put under that amount of stress it actually reacts by putting down new bone so you expect the radii to be different sizes so we started to first scan radii and try and find pairs that showed differences and so we were doing all this sort of thing and then we decided well why don't we try photogrammetry to look at individuals uh, rather than just scanning because with photogrammetry you can put them to put all the pictures together and then make a 3d image and um, we thought we'd try that with skulls and so we, we chose 10 skulls and uh, had them multi pictures uh, done of each one of them and then made these 3d models and we thought as a test, we wanted to see whether um, osteologists would find them as much use as handling the real thing or, or were they any use at all? Could it in some cases be used as a precursor to making the decision whether or not you wanted to handle one and, and look at it more, more detailed or could you get enough from just this? And so we put together this, this um, website called uh, Virtual Tutors that had four osteologists. It was basically an osteological experiment because you could share them around the world. So what it means is if it works and if osteologists think that, that, that these uh, virtual skulls are good enough to 
act as something that, that they could study, then you don't have to handle them. You could look at a skull and have 20 osteologists around the world doing what we're doing now, looking at the skull and talking about it, and you wouldn't have to handle it. You could even do it during the excavation, perhaps not an underwater excavation, but um, a land excavation. So the site was done primarily for osteologists to look at them, but then we decided that we'd have a front part of it for general public to actually look at it. And so we put the skull of the carpenter and a few objects relating to the carpenter on it. Um, and so the general public can do that. And the idea is to, when we can, is to actually add to that. So, you know, we've got displays of, of our main characters like the carpenter and the cook and uh, the um, master gunner, etc., within our exhibition. So we could in time to put models of all of those objects there so you'd have a virtual um, museum, if you like, with objects that you could you could manipulate in 3D. So the osteologists found that, that they were very, very useful. Mm -hmm. um, some of them thought they were better than the real thing because you can zoom in right. and because they're done in such detail and look inside the skull, if you like, without actually handling it and getting your head in an awkward position. You can look in the eye sockets for evidence of scurvy or various other things. So... Um, uh, the jury w is not completely in favor of them to the exclusion of mm -hmm. handling, but all of the individuals who've looked at it so far said that, that they would really value doing that first as a decision as to whether or not to, to look at things. So that's why Virtual Tutors was done, a lot, quite a long story, but, but that then led into us doing, doing further work, which, which is, again is part of the, the new display that, that we've got on at the moment. Yes, and I encourage everyone listening to go and have a look at that. I was exploring the site the other day and showing my 11-year-old um, son and he just found it amazing that we could just rotate this skull and, you know, zoom in, have a close look. It's absolutely brilliant. So you've, you've mentioned this new exhibition. I w I'd love to talk about that. I've seen a lot on social media recently about the exhibition, which is The Many Faces of Tudor England. So tell us a little bit about the science and the research behind that and what does it tell us? We've talked a bit about that. But what does it tell us about the crew of the Mary Rose. All right, well, the whole thing began basically because of the osteological work that was done for um, for virtu the Virtual Tudor website. Okay. And what happened is that one of these 10 skulls that uh, was we had photogrammetry of and was one of the models that's on the osteological part of the site, um, what we did to begin with is we had four osteologists who had either a real skull or they had both a, a real skull and a... Uh, photogrammetric skulls. So they all looked, all the, the four osteoarchaeologists each looked at both the models and the, reals, uh, and the real things. And all of them, in looking at both the models and the real things, said that one of the skulls they thought was of African ancestry because there are all sorts of morphometric measurements that can actually um, be used to suggest origins of individuals. And, um, and we thought, blimey, we hadn't, you know, we hadn't even done that because the osteoarchaeologist who'd put their bodies back together again wasn't tasked with, with doing any of that right. sort of thing. Yeah. She'd done she'd done actually quite detailed measurements, but her main thing was putting the bodies back together again, not any detailed research on them. The thing the observers observations she made are excellent, but that's you know, she she wasn't there to do specifically that. So we were looking at it now as a completely different uh, different thing, and so we thought, okay, well, let's let's see what we can do uh, regarding that, and that's how the entire thing started. Uh, a television company picked up a press release that had been done between Mary Rose Trust and Portsmouth University on the DNA work we'd done on the dog. So we had one dog on on board that we again looked at the morphology of at the Royal Vet College in London. They'd said, oh, they thought it was a terrier, but there were four or five different types of terrier it could be. So um, there's a very good ancient DNA lab at the University of Portsmouth which is the, the city that the Mary Rose is in and so we worked with them and actually managed to get both mitochondrial and genomic DNA from the dog so that's basically you're getting all the the information that you can from the from the genomic DNA and that gave us the breed um, and uh, the breed is actually closest to the modern Jack Russell which is just oh, okay. <laughs> unbelievable um, now, we're not saying Jack Russells were around in 1545, <laughs> but the other interesting thing is it came up with the fact that it got re recessive gene for something that causes too much uh, uric acid, which is thought to have been more of a modern thing due to inbreeding, especially oh. common things like Dalmatians. So we then tried, okay, well, can we try DNA to match bones? Because as I said before, we've got um, 92 fairly complete skeletons, but only 24 of them have got matched skulls. And that's because the osteoarchaeologist was building up like a, a Lego skeleton. And if you don't have the full um, spinal column, she wasn't going to put 
uh, the wrong faces on the wrong individuals, if you like. So mm -hmm. we wanted a quick way to see whether we could genetically say this bone is, is more likely to be with this body or this skull is more likely to be with this body. And obviously you've got the area that they were in. And sometimes you've got areas where you've got six people, sometimes four people. As I said, sometimes it's 22. But... Um, and we did that with the University of Portsmouth on mitochondrial DNA. In the press release, it said, yes, we think we can um, match bones with mitochondrial DNA, which is far more prevalent than genomic DNA, much easier. There's much more of it, and it needs far less amplification. So it's basically easier. But you can't tell as much. You know, you, it's because it's only the mother's inherited. Uh, right. Uh, it's only the mother's side of it you get, but it's good enough to match bones, and that was what was picked up by Avanti Media, and um, and with that they said, well, what can we do? What, what, what sort of thing can we do? And we said, well, we could try and find out who Henry is. Where is he from? Or, you know, what is it? And so we did. We also for our new museum had got we got individuals who were either closely associated with certain objects like an archer you know if an archer is wearing a wrist guard on the on the radius and on the and carrying a long bow you could be pretty certain he's an archer mm -hmm. uh, we've got people in the galley and you can be pretty sure, sure that one of them was a cook um carpenter some one individual directly below the carpenter's cabin with a a, a tool belt uh with a with a, a subsidiary set of equipment with a sawhorse yeah he's probably a carpenter so we've got quite a few individuals that we'd isolated as having as big potential uh, characters on board within our profile of crew members so a purser a master gunner we haven't got the surgeon but we've got the surgeon's objects and um and so they they have main cases of their own and we're trying to tell their stories by their objects and by what we found from their skeletons and um, and so we decided that we would try and find out where they were all born by doing isotope analysis. So the only one we didn't do is a master gunner because to to actually get the best material for isotope analysis is, is by drilling the teeth. So he, he didn't have many teeth because he had very poor dentition. So we didn't want to extract one of his teeth. So we'd got basically 10 individuals um, that we could we could get isotopic information from. So... Um, Isotopes are elements that have got a slightly different uh, number of uh, neutrons and protons within the atom, and so they can some of the, and so so carbon has got a number of isotopes. So the main elements that we've got, all of them have got isotopes, um, and those are normally known by the number of protons and neutrons that you add up within the atom. And so carbon fourteen, for example, is because that's what the, the numbers of the protons and neutrons. So they've not got specific names because they're still carbon; they're just slight variations. And these, the ones that can help us with uh, finding out where people are, have come from are primarily carbon, strontium, sulfur, uh, nitrogen, and um, oxygen. And they can tell us about uh, oxygen, for example, is very good at, at telling uh, how warm things were, various climates. Uh, carbon and nitrogen can tell the type of food, uh, whether it's plant-based and then if you use the oxygen you can say whether it's near the sea or away from this the temperature sorry the climate zone mm -hmm. sulfur will tell you whether it's closer to the sea or further away from the sea so it's actually a best fit of all of these things so you drill the teeth and you collect information from them from these isotopes and then you try and see what matches best on the isotope maps you have for the distribution of the range of figures for these isotopes and with those you can tell whether somebody ate a lot of protein whether it was animal protein how high up the food chain it was so if it was beef it's a lot higher than, than if it was fish for example and um and you can tell the difference between salt water and fresh water fish with the sulfur amount so it's basically just trying to make the best fit of all the information you've got so it doesn't give you an exact postcode mm -hmm. but it does give you areas where, where people are likely to have been born and brought up so the teeth basically it's encas encapsulated in the teeth during the time that you are growing up and it's it brought in through the plants it's the food you eat and the water that you drink so the strontium for example gives you an idea of the underlying geology because the strontium is very high in in, in volcanic areas and it's it's elsewhere as well but again you've got hot spots of where you're going to have higher or lower so we can tell for example with henry if we match everything up um there are about three places in england that he could be born and he was born here and we found that out from the the isotopes that uh and from his mitochondrial dna his mother's so the isotopes say he was born 
in Eng probably in England because it's definitely within that temperate zone. And the areas where you've got the strontium readings, which are similar to his, are either in Devon, a tiny bit in Wales, and a tiny bit in Scotland. Well, giving the population of Devon was a seafaring population is more most likely that he was there. So Henry's a bit of a, um, an idea about how it works. But so with all of our um, individuals, we found out sadly that that Henry was born in England because we thought, oh my goodness, how then are we going to find out um, about his ancestry? So that's when we we tried the DNA with him, and the mitochondrial DNA came through and said, and had a haplogroup. So that's a, a collection of, of genes um, that that are specific to a clustering basically and that that group that he's got is a bit like a blood group but if you want to call it that uh is is around both in england in small bits it's quite rare england north africa turkey bits of the mediterranean but quite a small number in england so it basically said we couldn't he was english he was born there his teeth said it you know it's within the groundwater his mother could have been from England, but she could have been from the other places. The genomic DNA came out at the very, very, you know, last minute before we were wrapping up the film and actually said that his father genetically is closest to uh, Berbers of, of uh, North Africa. Right. So it was like Berbers today. So obviously it's, it's today rather than 500 years ago. But um, so his father was born in North Africa. He was born in England. Mother could have been born in either place. So the African ancestry bore out with him. But we'd also got results from our other individuals. And interesting, the guy who was found beside the chest with the ivory um, carving yes. came out as being from a much warmer climate. Right. So it would be med Mediterranean. Now, it Italy is a good, you know, suggestion, but you can't, you know, you can't be that sure. We've got very, very good geological maps for uh, for Britain. They're not so good elsewhere, so it's not as easy to, to pinpoint things. But there's a, you know, he's not English, and he's probably Mediterranean. Venice is a, you know, good shot. Um, and similarly, the carpenter who within whose chest we found uh, a cluster of, of silver coins, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, mm -hmm. um, uh, within his chest. Uh, and also four Spanish ads is on board. So there were six carpenters. We know that because of the number of uh, tools that are, you know, you, you've got so many different types of planes that are, and so many tool, hold six tool holders, for example, and it was known that carpenters brought, brought their own group tools on board. So we think we've got six carpenters. So four Spanish ads is at least one of them, you know, could have been from Spain. And yes, the, the carpenter who was in the uh, lower deck with his set of equipment came out again as being quite, quite similar to the potential Venetian gentleman uh, as coming from m the Mediterranean. So now we've got three individuals that out of the 10 that we've got isotopic information from that are suggested as not being English. And then our Archer Royal, who was found, and he was, again, he was, they were, there were five people around a gun, but he was in a closed area. The gun had come off the deck as a ship sank, sort of pivoted in its ports, and it's nearly vertical, sort of sticking out of the mud on its carriage. And a space, therefore, was created underneath to, in which a whole load of shot from the main shot locker fell and trapped an individual amongst the shot. Consequently, both of the lobes of his head were smashed in with shot. So studying his skull, even if, if we could, we wouldn't have found any you know features that were different. As mm. I said, the archaeologist wasn't uh, tasked with, with looking for ancestry. And his isotopes came out. This, this chap was found wearing an Arms of England wrist guard. He got a pomander, a beautiful boxwood pomander, on on his sword belt, hanging by a silver ribbon. Um, he got quite a number of, of groats, um, which are silver coins, more than a week's wages carried on his person. He got a phallic knife. He got all sorts of high-value things, a comb in a, a pouch, comb in a purse that was completely different style to any of the others. Uh, he was carrying a sword. He had a, a bow, a broken bow was found within the end of a bow, and a load around his body, a load of edging, silk braiding that you might expect to be on a uniform, you know, like you put around the edges of curtains or so, uh, mm -hmm. of cushions and things. Um, not bias binding, but really nice braid and survived, and it's still absolutely beautiful, this silk braid. But a fair amount of it, and if you look at the any of the paintings of, uh, the king's bodyguards in save the departure from the field of the cloth of gold or um, the part departure from Dover for the field of the cloth of gold they're all wearing red uniforms with with gold 
braids in stripes and then around the waist and then on the shoulders etc so could it have been part of that with this with this royal ornamental um wrist guard and you know it came out that he was probably from north africa you know his isotopes are just <laughs> off the wall that is you know so we've got a royal archer who we think was one of two belonging to it, it belonging to if you like in the employ directly of the captain sir george carew who was a member of one of 50 of the king's closest bodyguards these weren't these were the king's own they were they were established by the household not by um the crown if you like and they were 50 called the king's spears and they're sort of his personal bodyguards they did they go wherever he doesn't necessarily have them walking around his person but mm -hmm. they are they they represent him in all sorts of places and one of the things that you have to do you can pay 50 quid a year to become one of these people called the king's spears you wear a badge of saint michael on your on your hat um and you are expected to for your 50 pounds maintain and equip two good archers right. so we found two of these wrist guards one on this body one unfortunately by itself on on the orlop deck above four people in the hold um and this was on this on this chap's hand and it bears um the royal crown and and on his swaki mali pons uh, around it as as is, is, is the case and then intertwined with that are the tudor rose and again catherine of aragon's pomegranate and and triple turret of castile and then around it there's an ave a prayer to the virgin mary so you know this is quite a long time after yes yeah. against death and there are two of these they're almost exactly the same these wrist guards one of them on this royal archer or we question mark royal archer who turns out to to be african and it just sort of throws our whole idea of um, <laughs> Henry VIII's crew out of the window, if you like, because we know that most of them were were his his jousting partners. You know that the the people who are the the captain and the uh, the major crew members were all elite members of of the inner circle of his society. So within that, we have you know somebody who who is potentially from North Africa. So that then got us to look at uh, obviously historical records, and if you think about it there are quite a number of references you've got the fleming who survived the sinking and is the best eyewitness account mm -hmm. so you've got something from the low countries anthony anthony who's who's the person responsible for doing the drawings of and writing the uh, inventory for all of the king's ship the 58 vessels within the king's ship are in or were initially in three rolls on vellum where you had the painting of the ship and all the objects so it's the only illustration we have of the mary rose afloat but the person who did this who was within the office of the ordinance um as a, a then a, a clerk in 1546 was the son of Antonius Antonius, who is a Fleming, who is a beer salesman, um, because most of the brew trade in England, in London, was undertaken by Flemings. Um, we have the Mary Rose transporting a group of gunners from Gdansk to Flodden in 1513. So she's taking as a troop transplant, uh, transplanter, transporter up to Flodden. Yeah. And the person who, because Henry was in France at the time, um, the person who was directing that was Catherine of Aragon in in Henry's place. Mm -hmm. So you know you've got this whole troop that being transported uh, who were foreign. There was a French gunner who was who uh, was not on the Mary Rose, but the trial happened on the Mary Rose as a flagship of this. Well, he wasn't French; he was from the Low Countries. Again, a Fleming um, who was who was on board one of the ships. There are we've had a Spanish um, surgeon at one time listed on the Mary Rose. Um, so we're beginning to find that, that actually, you know, there's probably more multicultural than we thought. And then if you look at the objects on board, we've got huge number of things that came from all over the place. The combs, for example, of which we've got about 82. Well, they're imported in the thousands from, again, from Ant through Antwerp, which is one of the major uh, hubs. Um, and probably made in the low countries are sundials which are beautiful tiny pocket watches if you like those are all uh, calibrated their compasses are calibrated for the, the signs on them are calibrated for nuremberg um we've got um coin balances on the ship that the coins of which you're testing the weight of these are tiny balances with with the weights for different coins all of them are foreign not one english coin so what was that doing on board the mary rose if they weren't foreign people the other clincher is a and this is where again uh 
looking at paintings and, and stuff is so good. We had a, a wooden stick that had got some really unusual leather plaiting as a handle of it, sort of like the horse whip you might get, mm -hmm. a, 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 whip, no, no, a bull whip. If you go to Spain, you can buy a bull whip, and the end of it is often plaited uh, leather strips. And so we got this with a couple of things that just looked like uh, flaps for pockets. And looking at a Bruegel image, you've got something called Money Changer. And there sitting on the table is one of these stick purses. And you basically, you've got a stick and you, you have six or eight pouches, drawstring leather pouches around it. And sometimes on the outside of them, you've got other pouches, tinier pouches with these little flaps with, with buttons. And this is for keeping um, coins of different um, countries, so that and particularly in places like a market town where you'd have multicultural people coming to buy, you'd um, you'd have these money changers who would be able to do that. So we've got a money changer on board. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so and then then all the all, all, you just go through the list of of. Uh, Objects found a cowrie shell. Okay, that's not English pepper. That's not English. A trade network. You know, we we think that we're on on the outskirts, but but you know, we were in the middle of European trade. It, London was a bustling city. You got mm -hmm. Italian bankers that were that were um, that, that were lending money to Henry to keep to keep him him in wars and women. Um, it, it was very very multicultural, and that's reflected in the crew. So even more than we thought before, you know, our our wonderful preserved moment of Tudor history is actually a pretty good cross-section of probably what, what certainly London population would have been like and, and probably Portsmouth. And you just look at the, the accounts for the raising, the attempts to raise the Mary Rose immediately after she sank. And the people who are employed to do it are, are Venetian carpenters, the people who are directing the putting the ropes under the hull to try and, and raise it are, are Italians. And um, then later, they gave up... Uh, trying to raise Mary Rose because they, they broke the foremast or maybe it had broken before or maybe this is where the, the work that had been done on the ship caused it to break if the, that work had been undertaken. So they, they leave it and then divers are, are hired to salvage the guns of it. And again, it's it's an Italian, um, Peter Paul Corsi, living in Southampton, who is tasked with getting a team. And the team are five divers one of whom is called Jack Francis, very Spanish type, a French type name. Jack Francis, who the the guy that he worked for, Peter Paul Corsi, um, the team were um, caught nicking tin basically off another wreck close to the Isle of Wight. They were working both wrecks at the same time, Mary Rose and this other wreck. The other wreck was owned by, the, the ship before it became a wreck, was owned by some other Italians. So you've got these two groups of Italians. Um, and they took Corsi to, to court the Admiralty Court, High Court of the Admiralty. And in his defense, he said he wanted uh, Jack Francis to give a record. And so that's recorded in the in the uh, Court of the High Admiralty. So you can go and uh, look at the document and read it. And it actually says that he was born um, in the Insula de Guinea, which is the Isles of Guinea, which is West Africa, basically. So it could be Cape Verde, it could be somewhere around there. And there's a very old Portuguese, one of the, the oldest Portuguese settlements in West Africa is on one of the islands. And so he's getting a translator in court to translate from this language. And he says that he is a diver on, you know, diving on the Mary Rose and that he goes down and he's very good at picking up tin and various other things. Um, and the names of all the other, the, the names of four divers, all of which are things like blank or black, <laughs> so you know, perhaps they're, they're also black divers. So he apparently is uh, the lead diver from this team. So we've got the first named diver on the Mary Rose from 1547, and he's from what the west coast of Africa, and his team probably are as well. And then you know they're they're raising guns and anchors from from the wreck in 1545. So not so it you know it goes right the way through. And this is again the first probably historical documents can always be found and change change history but you know as far as we know this is the oldest testimony of a black person in in england and that's associated with the mary rose so it's it's quite <laughs> magical absolutely extraordinary stuff i just think what an incredible um time capsule <laughs> that's just i yeah it's mind-boggling really isn't it it's just the scale, it the scale just of never, it staggering it just never stops giving if you like you know there's <sighs> always more and um you know, I've been doing it for a long, long time, and actually, I'm here with with one of the other divers from from the Mary Rose. And one of the things we're discussing is that the big to-do list that we need to leave for the next generation of people who we hope will go back and recover the bit of the port side that we reburied in 2005 uh, when we found it without knowing it was going to be there and and couldn't didn't have the 
either the finance or the conservation capability to to look after it. So we re reburied it very thoroughly. So one of the things we'll be putting together is a, a big list of, of the things that we as probably the last people who, you know, the last archaeologists who dived on the wreck think that future archaeologists should do. So Good that enough. brings us right back up to the present. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. All that detail is absolutely amazing. Now, um, Alex, we're up to that time of the episode where we play a little game of 10 to go. So these are just 10, you know, random questions to get to know you a little better. Are you ready? I guess so. <laughs> I guess you have to be. Um, number one, name a favourite childhood book. Enid Blight and the Island of Adventure. <laughs> Oh, yes, I like it. Probably Blyton. completely non PC, but about all these kids going out and having adventures and they had to get to the island, they had to go by sea. But Swallows and Amazons is also a good one. But. All right, great. So, what do you do to relax and recharge? <laughs> Uh, well, one of the things we're doing is we're working on a database of all the Dutch East India Company vessels that we've worked on in our spare time. So, actually, <laughs> uh, we do a lot of diving on other wrecks. Uh, I try and go to the gym a lot and yeah. so my my re relaxing is is going to the gym and, and doing cycle and pump and various other things yeah that sounds good what's a favorite holiday destination Ooh, scotland at the moment lovely that's nice and what what's a book i i'm assuming you probably have lots of books on your bedside table what's one of the books that you're currently reading well, one of the books that I'm currently reading is um, a book. It's called The Lyle Letters, and this is really this is really sad. Um, <laughs> and it's actually a series of letters between Lord Lyle, who was Admiral of the Fleet, and then he was retired at, at uh, seventy to go and look after Calais, which was then in in the 1530s. This is 1533 to 15. 40. Okay. Um, it's the English outpost in France and there are letters between him and his wife, between him and the spies he had working for him in England, um, between him and his children and it's just because it's uh, he's at an outpost and everything's happening in those years, Crom Cromwell's around, you're having mm -hmm. Anne Boleyn dying and you've got these, and he's paying people in England to be spies for him and they're sending back bits of information and then there's a letter, that, there are a few letters that say, you know, I'm not committing this to, to paper but I'm sending my envoy to tell you in person right. and it's, those, it's just so much, every, it's everyday stuff because it talks about the, the money she gets to, that, that she's paying to have cushions made and the colour of them and various other things so it is, it's like a tapestry of, of Tudor life in this tiny outpost and it's so detailed and what you can get from, from these letters cover, covers everything from politics to um, descriptions of people's faces, pimples and all, you know, it's, it's just wonderful and the amount of extra information you can get from reading something which is just quite light reading is is really good and it's picking up things that you don't necessarily get from history books and what's more it means you can make your own deductions rather than read other people's deductions which is what you you get quite often when you you read the the, the books on tutor times if you like yeah so very that's good, what yeah. i've got on my bed at the moment yeah i've I got that one on my shelf actually <laughs> yeah i do but i've only dipped in like i've looked at certain things but now you've inspired me to to read the whole thing i think <laughs> bit about talking about Anne Boleyn's death is really interesting and then the other people you know that, that died with her and she's yes. sending that on the day uh, describing it and sending it this is this is his secretary uh, Lyle's secretary is in London at the time sending the the information back to Lyle yeah fascinating stuff so what was your first paid job uh, first paid job was in Debenhams which is a, a big department store oh, yes. Uh, in the, I did geology as a um, one of my things at university. I did along with archaeology in the first year. You do a number of things, so I was quite interested in gemstones. And they had a, a jewelry section that dealt with gemstones, and uh, and so I was in on that. And that was a Saturday job. Fabulous. So, what's a new skill that you would like to learn? How to use a computer properly. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you're doing database stuff. It sounds like you know how to use it, definitely. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. If you could go back and give your teenage self some advice, what would it be? Follow your heart, hmm. which is what I did anyway. Well, but I would yeah. do that to everybody. You know, just, um, yeah, if you want to do something, make sure it happens. Yeah, that's a good one. Now, now, if you could travel back to witness just one event in Tudor history, what would it be? I'm afraid it would have to be... <laughs> Sinking of the Mary Rose. Sinking of the Mary Rose, that's fine. Um, what's a favourite comfort food for you? Sausages. <laughs> I very rarely have them, but that's... That's like a comfort thing, yeah. And lucky last, what would you like to see more of in the world? I think less disease and famine. So it's not more of, it's mm -hmm. less of. Less of. I don't think, 
Yeah. yeah. No, that's fine. And now the lucky last thing, Alex, that we do on the show is we ask our guests for a tutor takeaway. So something that our listeners can go and explore, might be a website or watch a film or read a book. Do you have a tutor takeaway for us? I do, and I'm looking at it at the moment. Ooh. It is the it, – it's um, – well, it's an engraving, but you can get colored engravings, okay. and it's called The Encampment of the English Forces Near Portsmouth. Okay. And it shows, the thinking of the Mary Rose, but it shows the whole of the Portsmouth landscape, the harbor, uh, South Sea Castle, the seafront, the French fleet, the English fleet, the Mary Rose Moss. And the entire, Henry Henry's on a horse in front of South Sea Castle. And on the on South Sea Common, which is still common ground today, uh, are all of his troops and the tents for the troops. And they're little vignettes of people having picnics. So there are women in it, there are men in it, there are officers in it, there are archers in groups, there are pikemen bundled in groups. And you can go in and look at detail and you will see the type of sword belt being worn on the individual, the color of the clothing, the objects that they've got on the table, many of which we can see on the Mary Rose, a detail of... of Tudor life within that painting is is second to none. It is absolutely incredible. And it's taken, the engraving was done in 1788, but it was copied from a wall painting uh, in uh, the house of, of Henry VIII's master of horse, Anthony Brown. So it's a, it's a faithful copy that was done by the Society of Antiquaries from a 16th century painting that then burnt, burnt when the house burned down. So it's the only one we've got. But the detail within that for anybody who's interested in Tudor fashion, that you can get the different styles of shoes, different styles of hats. If you go through the whole, there must be 300 people within the illustration. And each one of those, if you get a high resolution copy, um, you, can, you can explore in absolute detail. And in fact, when deciding on the color of the the style of the hair for the individuals who are are we had facial reconstructions of i looked at the cowdre and looked at the number of people that had gray hair different hairstyles etc and said okay well we'll just have a smattering of each uh within it i mean the detail is incredible it's like going back in time what a brilliant takeaway and in almost 40 episodes that's the first time anyone's ever mentioned it so thank you so much i know the one you're talking about but i'm going to go back and have a a uh, really close look at that. So, Alex, this has been so wonderful. I've certainly learned a lot, and thank you so much for taking the time to share your um, expertise with us. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Natalie, and uh, have a good day. Yeah, <laughs> yes. day. yeah well, evening for me, but that's uh, I'll have a good evening. <laughs> thank you yeah, so much. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website www.onthetudortrail.com where you will also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family and click on the all important follow button so you'll never miss an episode. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all the behind the scenes news. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.